Hello everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of Build, Paint, Play. I'm Dave. And I'm Jake, and with us we have... Hey, I'm Jeff Hall. Jeff. How are you? <laughs> He's up this way. Yeah, He's over here, right? In the grid. <laughs> yep. Um, so, <laughs> how you doing, Jeff? Uh, great to Good. have you on the show. Yes, it's wonderful to be here with you guys. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to chatting about cool hobby stuff. Excellent. And I, I just noticed as well that... Uh, that, I mean, Jake is always wearing his Alpha Omega Hobbies uh, merch. Usually. Uh, but Jeff's wearing his Games and Stuff merch. Look at that. <laughs> the battle of the uh, the stores has begun. Yes. Uh, no, we're, we're good. We're like different. We're like different, you know, areas. Like I, I have, he's <laughs> south of the wall. I'm north of the wall. Like everything. <laughs> That's pretty much, yeah. Pretty much it. That's yeah. good. Uh, and of course, I'm wearing uh, my backwards Evia metal t-shirt because uh, Dave Taylor, my counterpart in the UK uh, runs the Evia Metal fa Facebook group. But uh, yes, hooray! Certainly good to uh, to have you on. For those who don't know uh, Jeff or haven't seen Jeff on uh, episodes, quite a few episodes of Painting Happy Little Minis uh, that we used to do, um, Jeff is the operations manager. Correct. Hooray! <laughs> All good. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to get the title right. Uh, operations Manager of uh, Games and Stuff uh, here in uh, the Baltimore Mid-Atlantic uh, region. Um, and uh, tonight we thought we'd have Jeff on to talk a little bit about uh, one of your particular passions, which is uh, building elaborate tables for uh, role-playing and for wargaming. Uh, that is correct. Stuff. So, uh, how about you tell us, uh, give us a, a five minute rundown of um, how you got into doing uh, elaborate games? Uh, I guess it would start uh, as I, as I, as Dave and Jake as well. I, I also worked for Games Workshop for many years, um, and I ran the U.S. events, Games Day, uh, Grand Tournaments, all that for for a number of years, and uh, you know it was always seeing those beautiful games day tables and those awesome builds and white dwarf and everything else that just always made me love elaborate scenery and things. So when I started, you know, I've been a D and D player since middle school or beyond. So I, you know, but that those days we were lit in to, limited to some graph paper and, you know, maybe a miniature if you were lucky uh, as things progressed, you know, and we were able to take all that cool terrain we had for Warhammer and 40 K and everything. And then kind of, just 
also apply that to, to role playing games. And it was always something I enjoyed. And then it just kind of grew and grew and grew to a point where I couldn't really run a game without some giant mad imaginative plan to go into <laughs> what they were doing that night and set up the whole scene, whether it was a town or a dungeon. Uh, you know, I was always a huge fan of Dwarven Forge and things like that. And, you know, had a lot of their things. Um, so, yeah, and it just continued to grow and grow. And, you know, I love running big, crazy games that, that have huge setups that sometimes require, you know, a 10, 15 minute break. And I'll wipe the table and set it all up anew because they've gone to a new new area in the game or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's like it's like a movie set for me. I'm like, I want to <laughs> I want to make it as more elaborate each time with lights and fog and whatever else I can, can muster. <laughs> Throw it in excellent excellent that's uh that's super cool to uh hear we'll be uh talking a lot more about that uh in a few minutes uh but i just quickly want to say uh hi to james james is uh in watching the episode uh, what's welcome. up jim There's jim should i be saying jim my bad I, either i mean i i shorten everybody's name it's a it's a habit of mine and, and yeah. apparently uh I, apparently some people don't like that uh <laughs> but yeah, like I found out the other day, my buddy Kevin, who I've called Kev forever, yep. uh, posted the other day that some guy at his work called him Kev. Yep. And and he was like all upset. He's like, this guy like doesn't know me. And I was like, should I not call you Kev? And he's like, I mean, I'd prefer not, but like at the same time, it's cool. He's like, I've known you for like 20 years. So like, it's, it would be weird if you didn't call. And I was like, <laughs> all right, cool. I, was like, I wish you had said something. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, cool. <laughs> okay. Either way is good. Excellent. Um hobby let's talk about what we've been doing the the last uh week who shall begin i i'll start sure i have cool. been painting more and more terrain uh as for for the tremendous tome of epic dungeons we oh. just did some photos and uh i've been painting some adventurers for that and some dastardly drow and evil folks to go with that and uh because i've been doing this big underdark set up so that's that's kind of what i've been working on the past two weeks cool yep uh so yeah as just said on uh so it was sunday uh, i went down to jeff's place and uh had the the whole uh, how long was it nine feet yes it's a seven foot table and then i had a two foot extended piece i added to the end to build the drow city on so yeah it's yeah. about nine foot long nine foot by four, nine foot, by four. uh sort of underdark setup with the all the caverns and uh, raised areas and stalactites and it was uh, super elaborate. We got uh, loads of photos. Um, it was very cool. Should I lift up and, and spin around and show them? <laughs> no, we'll make no, them no, let's save dizzy. that. <laughs> we'll, we'll tease it out over the next few weeks. But, All right. uh, but no, it was uh, it was definitely cool. It'll be the uh, the first full um, section in the, the Tremendous Tome uh, will be Jeff's Underdark build, which will be uh, great. Very, uh, Jeff, I'm Jeff. I'm so jealous that I don't live that you don't live near me or I don't live near you and I can't play in that game. Yeah, uh, when when you see the photos of it, it's it's like yeah, that's it's definitely. We, we need cool. to plan a summer, you know, D and D weekend or something. I, uh, everybody absolutely. can just come absolutely. together and we make it happen. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> that would be uh, very cool. Um, excellent. So, uh, ooh, sorry, I just. I always love it when we switch back, like back and forth each week between a guest and then not a guest the following week. There are some things in OBS that I need to go and adjust. So, uh, do you want do you want me to go next while you're adjusting things? <clears throat> uh, sure, yeah, that'd be great <laughs> if you can do that. Uh, so, I'm still slogging away on my uh, 2,500 point uh, Horus Heresy armored spearhead. I knocked out all the preliminary colors, washes um some of the weathering and i've started doing my yellow panels um i do not like working with avalon sunset i don't like the way that that paint covers uh i'm gonna have to do like multiple layers to get it to, to actually not be kind of like wow. muddy looking um but so i like i started doing the yellow panels on the the three that are primed and, and weathered yep um and i finished paint i finished building Two more predators, another Sakaran. So all I have left is upstairs. The Derrideo is soaking in warm, soapy water. Right. And tomorrow I'm going to build that and use a hairdryer to straighten out the auto cannons. <laughs> and this is the last tank. The last tank to build. Nice. And then I'm and then I, and then everything is built. So 
that gives me by t- after the, by tomorrow it gives me two weeks yep. to get everything painted so I can take it with me. Fifteen days. What uh, chapter are you doing? I'm doing Iron Warriors. Iron Warriors. Okay. I mean, their their rules are are great for Armored Spearhead, and I sure. I like the. Uh, I, I've I've never done a metallic paint scheme, so I was like, okay, I'll I'll do this. I figured I could do it pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, the li- I like Dave and I've talked about it a bunch of times, but the, just so you know, the list is basically it's three Sakarans, four Predators, a Sakaran Vendor, a Contemptor Dreadnought, two Leviathan Dreadnoughts, and a Derrideo Dreadnought. That's the whole list. Yeah. <laughs> so, All right. Thanks. It should be interesting. There's huh? a good there's a good yellow and pro acryl that can work better than Avril and Sunset. Which one's that? It is. Oh. <laughs> it, is it thick enough to cover black? Uh, warm yellow. I really like warm yellow. Okay. And that'll that'll cover black? Uh, I don't know that I've used it straight over black just yet, but against metal, it should cover pretty well. I, You know, I, yep. I'm a big fan of, of this one. Yep. All right. I'll have, to, I'll have to see if I can get the guys at Monument Hobby to uh, send me some pro acryl. One, um, one other thing you could, might want to try. Um, I mean, if you're with the pro acryl is uh if well, i'm not sure if this would work the same way uh but if you mix it with a little bit of uh the burnt orange mm. um mix that warm yellow with a bit of the burnt orange or if you're using the avalon sunset ah, uh mix it with a little bit of scrag brown so i i tried doing um i tried doing avalon sunset because like i even watched a video where like duncan rhodes used two coats of Averland over black, like a, a black painted marine. Yep. And it looked great. And I was like, oh, well, then I'll just do that. And I started putting it on and I'm like, there is no way this is going to look like that. So and then I switched and I did a layer of Xandry dust. Yep. Because it's like, you know, it's a nice tan. It's another base color. So I put that down and then I'm going to put the yellow over it and it still looks like trash. So I was like, nah, I'm going to have to figure out another way to do this. Maybe that's, <laughs> it might be your pot, it might be your pot of Averland. Have you got a vortex? It is brand new. I just opened it. Uh, still, <laughs> it might be. Okay, yeah, maybe. Um, I've often a... used Avalon over black and never had many yeah. issues. It covers pretty solidly. Yeah. Have you got a vortex mixer? I do not. Give it a oh, okay. You need to give it a burst on a vortex mixer. The other thing you can do. Do you have a uh, reciprocating saw? Saws no. all. Uh, okay. Because I <laughs> with that you can you can put that in a G clamp. Put your paint pot in a G clamp and slide the G clamp into your uh, sawzall instead of a blade, and then oh nice fire that up. Right. <laughs> one of my uh, one of my regulars has a vortex mixer and he lives down the street from the store, so maybe I'll just be like, run home and shake this up for me. Shake this for <laughs> me. Bring it back. Yeah, pop a little uh, bit of a um, little bit of medium in there, um, and uh, yeah, just. I was blown sense. away because I did it on like my test models and it came out great. And I was like, what is going on? Yeah. Yep. I even tried using like the Avalon Sunset Air, and I just didn't thin it. I just used it right out of the pot, uh, and it yeah. still no, it the, still doesn't look good. Yeah, the air is always going to be too thin. But um, the other thing you might need to do is just uh, like leave it open for let like it thicken up a bit for half an hour, <laughs> let it thicken up a bit, and then vortex mix it, and then give it a go. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, That's a big, Brian, you, actually, so you got fifteen days. <laughs> yeah, no, so I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'll be, I'll be, I'll get everything done. Everything will done. I mean, I don't know if I'll get all the like the finishing touches and stuff on them that I want, all my water side transfers, but right. they'll be, they'll be painted tabletop quality to, to, to put them on the boards. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, Sean jumped on. Brian jumped on. Keith jumped on. What's up, guys? Uh, Brian, that's like, it's like 2,500 points on the nose. It is pretty, it is pretty much on the nose, right? It is exactly 2,500 points. No, I mean, I can smell it from here. That's super cheesy. Nice. Cheesy. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I have been painting. Nice brutes. Uh, these are for a uh, client of mine, Brian. Uh, so I've got ten of those to finish off for him. He's going to be using those at uh, Adepticon. So uh, he's got silvers, chipping, weathering to do, and then the bases. The longest part is going to be all of the um, the mushrooms that are on the bases, really. You gonna, you gonna do Mario style, red with white spots? Uh, some of them will be, yeah. Oh, here we go. This is um, so this is a war chanter that I did a while ago. Oh yeah, yeah. I like all the barnacles and stuff on this. Pretty rad. Yep. The, I supplied um, all those mushrooms to him, so believe me, yeah. I know there's a lot of them. Yeah, there are, there's <laughs> a ton. Uh, and this is like one of the. 
the bull boys. What are they? The gore grunters. The gore grunters, which doesn't he have like twenty or some gore grunters? Some it's, ridiculous amount. It's not twenty. It's it's only twelve, but it's still. It's like, only twelve. Okay. These these models are probably, ridiculous. It amount. feels like twenty. Yeah, <laughs> the models are so huge that take forever to paint. Um, so yeah, working on those. Uh, I have a couple of things uh, a couple of photos set up here so i'm just going to quickly switch to um the first ones of those uh, i mentioned the um table that i've been working on uh it is a table now that i've sent it off it's shipped out today um it's a table for warzone eternal it'll be at uh the demo table at adepticon um, this is the only photo i'm going to show until adepticon um, but this is a shot from it uh a trench line it's got a cool trench line. It's got a couple of bunkers. Uh, is this the one cool... for us? Pardon? Is this the one for us? Yep. Yep. Nice. So, uh, yeah, I, I haven't even shown Jake any of the photos. This is the first one that he's seeing. Um, but, uh, yeah. I've seen it. <laughs> What's that? I've seen it. <laughs> the pictures, <laughs> yeah. at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I showed you a picture on my phone. I didn't send them. Yeah. Not, not a good picture. I got a sense of it. Looks awesome. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was really interesting. There's a few um, new techniques that I used on this that I hadn't used before. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely a lot of fun. And I think uh, folks will like it, I'm hoping. But yeah, I had to build the crate over the weekend. Um, did it all crate it up so that it could uh, go out via FedEx today. Picked up about an hour before the show. Uh, and uh, what's the other one that I've got? Uh, sorry, the other photo is uh, I was doing some stuff for some of my pages in the Tremendous Tome of Epic Dungeons, uh, and this is the entryway uh, piece that I wanted to have as the, the opening spread for the, uh, the Sinister Sands of the Snakekin. Um, yeah, that looks great. That so, is awesome. Yep. So that's all, that's built out of, um, so the the snakes are the King Cobra from uh, Reaper Bones. Okay. Uh, the minis on there from the um, are the frameworks from WizKids. Uh, and then everything else is foam. And the, uh, except for the, the rocky cliff bits, which are um, cork bark um, that I've used before and shown on some of the tables. And the toilet paper rolls, obviously. Uh, actually they're, uh, sorry. Yeah. They're cake, um, cake stand, uh, like the plastic cake stand pieces. Oh, nice. Um, but the cool thing, um, with them, so they're basically plastic hard tubes. Uh, the cool thing with those being plastic is that you can spray them with a textured paint to get a bit of a, um, sandstone look, but, uh, yep. Yeah. That all that <laughs> army painter, like all that army painter basing spray stuff is super cool. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely good. Uh, ben Williams said, "Just another snake cult." <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I've taken my photos for that and starting to lay out on that this week, uh, which would be super cool. Hooray! Um, radio. Let's bring us back to the big. Big screen. So, yeah, that's what I've been working on. I uh, haven't painted anywhere near as much as I did the previous week. But, uh, yeah, almost finished these 10 brutes and two tables, I guess. I didn't do the whole table in the week. It was just the, the final touches. <laughs> um, it's always interesting working with a, uh, with a client where they want to see how things are going. But at the same time, I knew I needed to have it finished by, like, Saturday or Sunday. Uh, so... As soon as I'd finished something, I'd send, fire off an email to Alex and say, hey, what about this? He goes, yep, perfect. That's just what I was thinking. Or, hey, can you put some more of that over here on this section? And you're like, okay, sure thing. He is, he is so knowledgeable about the whole Mutant Chronicles Warzone like, universe. Okay. Um, more so than anybody that I that I know or that I've met. Like, I mean, yeah. we're all we're all huge fans of different fandoms, and and I love Mutant Chronicles. I think it's a super cool setting. But his like level of knowledge is off the charts. Like, he oh. knows all the original edition stuff, all the second edition stuff, um, to the point that we were working on like fluff bits. Yep. And he was like, 
after after they were edited because we have an editor like either yeah. i'm editing other people's stuff or the other editor is editing mine and other people's stuff yep. alex was then like rereading all the edited stuff being like oh this is wrong like that's that would be this thing instead and it's like it's crazy the level that he's <laughs> that he is like toned to so excellent excellent it was funny um when i was building the um bunkers on there uh so it's so, uh, I guess in Al is it Algaroth? Yeah, Algaroth, yeah. Algaroth. Um Algaroth. Uh and uh yeah, building the bunkers and he, he was I showed it to him and he goes, Yeah, they they're good, they're they're gonna work, it'll be fine. Um, but uh maybe when you're doing some detail on them make it a little bit less um symmetrical or less balanced or smooth. Uh, like proper lines because the uh Algaroth builders are, are not as good as, uh, say, contemporary human builders. <laughs> Any of the yeah, the stuff they crazy. built would be uh, the like those guys would be fired on a on a modern uh, job site. So OSHA is not happy with them. They are not up to standard. Yeah, <laughs> so I had to I had to make a, a few slight adjustments, but uh, I think it still works pretty well. Are you uh, basing a lot of it on that awesome movie, The Mutant Chronicles, that came out? Oh. <laughs> um, so we, we have a we have a conference call every week, and every week without fail, either Rick or myself or Brian or Alex bring up that movie and how terrible it is. <laughs> <laughs> but yep. it had Thomas Jane in it. Come on, it, it has Thomas Jane. It has um, Sean Pertwee. It has. Uh, um what's his name ron perlman like i mean ron perlman is in every single like medium to low budget sci-fi film from like 1989 to like 2006 like yeah. it it should be great it is terrible <laughs> i don't even think they even bring up like the whole like the actual nature of of the dark like what what is it called the uh the, like the, the dark whole, apostles the dark the dark apostles and the symmetry and all yeah, that stuff. It, it was just like, Hey, there's is, some zombie dudes on Pluto or whatever. And it's kind of <laughs> like, wait, what? It is. It is so like barely connected to the, to the, the root material. I don't understand how they got away with even like why they even bothered licensing that. I don't get right. it. Yeah. It reminds me of like, it, it's like, it's like somebody actually attempted to make. So one of my favorite stories in all of hobbydom is that this has got to be years ago. So, um, Guillermo del Toro was really enamored of the idea of making a giant robot versus like monsters type of movie. And he approached the people who own monster apocalypse and was like, had his lawyer reach out to them and was like, Hey, Guillermo's really excited about this. He'd really like to make a movie about monster apocalypse. And they were like, well, I don't know. Like, you know, we want this exorbitant amount of money. And his lawyer was like, I mean, well, we can talk about it. So Guillermo talked to him and was like really work was excited about it. And then was talking to his lawyer and was like, I really don't want to if I pay that amount of money though, it's gonna really cut into the budget that I that I can prospectively get to make this movie. And his lawyer's like, You don't need to license it. Guillermo's like, What do you mean? He's like, All you need to do is change the nouns. Like it, it is the concept of robots fighting giant monsters has been around since like the forties and fifties in like pulp like yep comics and you know the original like black and white godzilla films like you don't need to license any of this so he's like okay so then guillermo put out uh pacific rim which is amazing but i was like so that shows you how you can make a great movie with a cool inspiration and then mutant chronicles is the complete opposite like they actually paid the licensing fee and then released this nightmare of a movie <laughs> and but paid to do it like they paid yep. to do that i was like oh my god what how I don't know. Madness. Madness. Uh, oh, Chris Gorka has joined us. Hi, Chris. Uh, hey. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What's going on, Chris? Okay, so we've uh, talked about our hobby. Where we're at. Uh, Jake's still got another uh, tank to assemble. He's only got 15 days. Well, actually, what I should say is, yeah, you're right. Tomorrow, it's two weeks. Yep. Two weeks. Two weeks. There we go. I think I uh, haven't seen Scott in the chat yet, so hopefully you'll watch yeah, him he's gonna, he's gonna be bummed he missed that. Yeah, he will. Um so I get I think that uh we are ready to yeah. Should I pull up the next slide? Sure. sure. Okay. Pulling up the next slide. Uh so 
now we're going to talk uh, a little bit, as we said earlier, we're going to talk a little bit more to Jeff about um, the uh, awesome table setups that you do, the the uh, both for wargaming and for uh, tabletop role-playing, that kind of thing. Um, I, see a lot of, I see a lot of Gale Force 9 little uh, desert buildings in there. Yep. All repainted. Sorry, just uh, <laughs> just quickly, uh, a comment I missed in the uh, chat before. Sean Gleason said, I've been painting a Lumineth hero, uh, Lirior. And got some games of uh, Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game and Age of Sigmar in. Nice. Very cool. Uh, so, yes. Uh, Gale Force 9 buildings, are they the round ones? So they're the round ones, yeah. And, the, and, and, the, uh, and the plus, there's a lot of th the plus shaped ones. Yeah, right. the little one. There's a lot of 3D printed stuff there. The spaceport pieces and uh, the big ship in the upper left corner. Uh, that's... Slave One ship there is a, mo a Ravel model kit. Um, that giant cantina is a thing from Imperial Terrain. This is a big 3D print. It's modular that can be shorter or longer. I have all the extensions on it, so that thing's huge. That takes up, that's a good two foot, you know, plus piece right there. Um, What's the yeah. other model kit from? With the Ravel one? The, so so the, I see I see Slave One, and then yep. what's the one to the left? The of other it? one's another Imperial Terrain 3D printed ship. They're, oh, they're nice. one of their ships. Um, there's a lot of Imperial Terrain buildings out here. All the other stuff. There's some Micro Art Studio stuff from their foam line that they print that they did. They're like biscuit foam stuff. And then there's just some other random pieces from like Micro Machine, Star Wars like toys. There's crazy little speeders from Attack of the Clones and other things. There. Yeah, it's a it's a whole it's a whole kit and caboodle of Star Wars that I ran at a convention uh, up in Pittsburgh back in September, and so that's kind of a is a D twenty miniature hybrid like Star Wars game, uh, you know, with a kind of using the old Watsy Star Wars rules and uh, but making it way more miniature based. Nice. Cool. What was the uh, what was the mission on this this table? What was the uh, that particular one? So they were working for the huts and they were trying to uh, secure a droid that had gone missing and uh, that had some data in it. So at this particular stage of the game, they were they were looking for the droid that had been kind of smuggled into the into the city. Right. So they were kind of going building to building and, and searching for the droid. All you need to do is find the bar and just go outside because droids aren't allowed inside. So there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Is this Jack Jakku or? Uh, it's kind of just a random desert planet. I didn't make it uh, straight up Tatooine or anything. I right. just, you know, it's another random thing. Excellent. Uh, uh, someone asked if it was from last year's Historicon. No, it was from um, a convention called Sibcon up in uh, north of Pittsburgh in september cool yep this is uh josh josh potter has just arrived hey josh welcome welcome uh tonight we're talking with uh jeff hall who is uh my co-author on the tremendous tome of epic dungeons and uh a longtime friend of myself and jake uh but we're going to be talking a lot about uh fun table builds and uh gaming really playing <laughs> so uh yeah super cool um what's the next so i think the next photo might be from the same convention did you keep all the star wars stuff kind of together or uh you... yeah i tried to um, i had this yeah. really really weird thing that i mentioned to you just before the show but um some of the photos when i tried to imp like bring them into obs um uh, they were they just rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise for no that's, apparent reason. Yeah, that's like why. Yeah, I I have no idea why. So, um, <laughs> Josh says mm, terrain one of my only weaknesses. Hmm, only? I don't think so. <laughs> We've got miniatures later on too. Jeff, uh, were you running this all twenty eight millimeter? Yep, yep, that's all twenty eight. We're using uh, a lot of uh, Legion stuff and three D prints oh, or. Good. A good bit of Legion, a lot of 3D printed stuff. There's a lot of Patreons and things that make tons of like RPG style characters for Star Wars. All the characters from Rebels and you know Bad Batch and all the shows and things. So right. there's like a, a bevy of of things. Th these shelves behind me, one of these, this whole shelf here is like 3D printed Star Wars miniatures in all of these little plain opens. <laughs> nice. I don't, not, I don't have a problem, not at all. No. No. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so yeah, switching over to the. Um, 
basically it's uh, an imperial base it's got the um oh the kiwi uh the laser kiwi who are the the battle kiwi battle yeah kiwi. So that's just some of the mdf uh landing platforms and and shield yeah. generator stuff from battle kiwi and the the, the walls and things and then uh, some monster fight club trees outside of the walls and then uh there's a 3d printed imperial transport there and a old another old model kit for the imperial shuttle and then all the landed tie fighters with the folding wings kind of like from the mandalorian or from uh Hasbro has a new line called like Mission Fleet or whatever that are basically perfectly Legion scaled ships that I've been buying a, a ton of at Target every time I see them. <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll, have to, you'll have to text me that so I can tell our Legion guys. That's pretty rad. Yep. Yeah. No, and mean, this one, they were smuggling in. We had, I was not in this shot, but they, they had commandeered a, a rebel, an Imperial transport. The kind of like the one that uh, oh, the they ended up using in the man. No, the one they used in the Mandalorian. Um, but it was actually the same one they sold as a toy in the seven, like back in 1977, but it was never in the movies that the stormtroopers like stood on the outside with the little, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. so I have a 3d printed one of those and they, they had commandeered that and they got inside. And then of course, as role-playing games tend to go, things went to shit pretty fast and they started blowing things up. So <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, blow it up. <laughs> nice. Blow it up and run. Yeah, pretty right. much awesome uh so the oh the next one we've got this uh, from a slightly different angle uh i say slightly i mean it's a completely different angle but uh so it has the uh this is from the end with the uh transport right the yeah they got inside that ship and fired the guns off and blew up part of uh the the pieces around it and everything started going bad <laughs> lots of stormtroopers came running out of of the elevators and from below in the base and yeah it got ugly really quick you just need the allied like drop bear army to come out of the trees yes yeah. <laughs> so um how many people would you have um playing in a game of this sort of size uh, usually about six to eight at a convention i try to squeeze in as many as i can i think this particular one we had about six people playing okay and did you have um how long did, so they all they played across both of those tables or uh, Yes. So this game I run typically at this convention, it's a Saturday all day from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. I schedule one game and it and I'll usually reset the table four or five to six times throughout the course of the day on different breaks and things as they go to different parts of the story. So as they went to new planets, we'd take a bathroom break, get some drinks, whatever, and I'd quickly try to reset up everything and, you know. They they you know screen wipe to the next location as they they came out right <laughs> awesome awesome actually I, I probably could have damn it, if only I knew how to do that sort of transition on oh uh, yeah you can do a different right. you do a different screen wipe each time it would yeah. have to be like the, the my favorite like, <laughs> <laughs> it would have been awesome sorry I need to next uh, time I need to be better I need to be when better. we do our all, when we do our all Star Wars episode okay sure <laughs> we'll get that going um no that's cool so, so 12 hours of i guess obviously yeah breaks but usually roughly hours. and there's an hour lunch and dinner break in there so it's about a 10 hour game of, you know yeah. play or so nice i think this particular one by about 8 30 or so they had gotten pretty much done with the story and we were all pretty wiped so we we kind of wrapped it right. <laughs> we, 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 had, we had reached our limit excellent did you hand up medals at the end yeah, I know. I should have like <laughs> everyone but the Wookiee. No, but the Wookiee didn't get one. Yeah, I was. I always thought that was crappy that Chewie doesn't get one. I was always like, right? It's ridiculous. At least they made up for that in the Rise of Skywalker and actually gave him a medal. Yeah, he gets Hans. I was like, I remember being right. like, that's, I remember being, that's specious. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, I think now we're into some. Uh, we're getting some fantasy uh, settings. So the first one we've got is the. Uh, bridge i don't know if it's across a river or it's a stone pier out into uh yeah ocean. so that uh, that was for a big age of sigmar game um and that piece there's i have a ruined version that you can see on the far side there and then the intact tower so in that particular game i had them both spanning a big water feature one was intact that you could cross and the other one was damaged and just had some fortifications on it uh kind of osgiliath style terrain very, 
very you know, you're, you're fighting across the river. Yep. You know, one side of the city was more intact. I had more of the intact buildings. The other side was all the ruins. And, you know, they were trying to, to get from one end to the other. Excellent. Where Whereabouts is that um, that bridge from? That is a company called Dark Realms Forge who does STLs. Again, I had a guy. I, there's a guy using uh, Florida called Panhandle 3D who does amazingly good affordable 3d prints and he's licensed to print all of the various you know main companies and he did a lot of those prints for me really really good stuff cool because yeah I can, I can imagine that tower or that that building with a um like a blue bluish slate kind of roof mm -hmm. for um for ours giliath or um gondor yeah Sorry, i did gondor. red roof on all the buildings in that line and uh also kind of give it more almost a king's landing feel like that okay. red, you know with the the to do some song stuff as well. Excellent. And uh, so was this from the, the game that you did at uh, Games and Stuff? Yeah, that was the Age of Sigmar campaign weekend we ran last June. Um, so I had seven or eight big tables, and this one was a like a 12-foot-long table for the mega battle kind of at the end where all the armies had converged. And they, after they had played on the individual tables uh, for the, the big narrative campaign weekend. Awesome. Hmm. Next up, uh, we've got another. Uh, it's another ruined bridge across a uh, across a river um, with some heavy heavy logging and deforestation on one side. Yes, that was for just a little skirmish um, battle in a D and D game. Uh, one of my my ongoing D and D campaign. Yeah, they were working their way towards a town that had been. You know, as you said, heavily logged. So there's a lot of all the dead Monster Fight Club trees on one side without the tops on. On the other side, it's still a little more intact. Um, and I use the WizKids modular bridge. That you can either push together or split apart into ruins, and they had to, to get across the, the gaps there. Cool. I love that model. I think it is super cool. And and you did a great job. That that table looks amazing. The fact that WizKids tries to sell that thing for like two hundred and fifty dollars, I'm like. It's a bridge. They're like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> it's only one fifty. Come on, that <laughs> bridge oh, is oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But still, I'm like, it's a, it's, it's just a bridge. They're like, yeah. I'm like, it doesn't come with like three billy goats and a troll, or you know, like, <laughs> like it doesn't go anywhere. It's just the bridge. They're like, yeah. I'm like, you guys are delusional. That thing is <laughs> so overpriced. That it's a great piece. I like you can remove the middle and you can make it like a smaller complete bridge yeah. or like one big complete bridge or like this all broken up. Like, I think it's really cool. Or but if you bought two, you could put them two middles together and actually have it even bigger. Yeah. Nice. So <laughs> it only cost me $300. Like, it's, right. it's so insane. Bridge, bridges are always the, the strangest piece of terrain, I think, because they're so, yeah. so super specific to what it does they they look great and they're very attractive but they also do that they funnel troops and they cause bottlenecks and uh so they might not work for the flow of a game right and most of the time but, they're not truly big enough for what would actually be going on across them yeah like if you think yeah. i have a lot of the old little forge world bridges and they're they're like two guys could walk across they're almost like footpaths <laughs> not sure, like yeah. you know you couldn't really get a unit across or anything marching on that thing yep and and Did even then see? even even with that reduced size they're still bigger than a lot of other pieces of terrain and, right and therefore yeah. they they cost more so the, mm -hmm. i think the coolest way i've seen a bridge used was a uh, ben just played in the new england horse heresy like tournament that they had like two weeks ago okay and they basically had so like let's say jeff and i are playing so they had a a standard like card table so like a you know three foot by six foot table yep and then they took uh, a plywood board and put it across to another table so jeff's army goes on one table my army goes on the other table and the bridge is basically connecting the tables and everything off the bridge was supposed to be like super caustic lava, and there was like a field protecting everything on the bridge, so you you had to go across the bridge. Right. Um, it was just a really neat way to kind of like have some dy like dynamic sort of terrain 
yeah. added to the game. And Ben was like, it was actually a really fun mission. But that's but to your point, Jeff, I mean, they took a plank that was probably like, I don't know, 18 inches across, and that was the bridge. Yeah. So so it wasn't necessarily representative of like a kick ass looking bridge it was, <laughs> yeah it was more like a like it could either look really cool or be usable and they were like right. let's go with be usable yeah and, and when i build these elaborate things and i set up especially you know I've, I've taken stuff to the store and i've set up like a whole legion tournament with all, each board very themed and then on the average day when people just come in to play they throw a lava mat down they put a couple fantasy houses on it maybe a snow hill and i just really want to like smash my head off the wall like <laughs> what what are you doing like why are you building these boards that don't look like anything yeah yeah but all, all of, that's so i'm the same way all of our all of our tables at our store are themed so like i have a desert mat and guess what's on it it's all desert terrain. Like I have hills and like the the crumbled sphinx and a bunch of like fallen statues and so like so everything is desert themed. And then I have like a city board. So there's all like urban buildings and rubble and like broken pieces and a landing pad. And then like so I went in today and I don't work on Sundays. So I know on Sundays they have a lot of a lot of guys come in and they'll play Conquest or Song of Ice and Fire or Legion or um Marvel Champions or Marvel Crisis Protocol. So it's either smaller sized games or skirmish games. And I went in today and I'm like, who played on these tables? Like all the tables are a disaster. And I'm like, we have so much matching terrain. Like what were you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's it's frustrating when when people don't <laughs> don't respect the the, yeah. the narrative of the, of the game they're playing. <laughs> well, you, know, you gotta be it's like you do better. Do better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, just uh, moving on to the next photo, we've got uh, so this is one from uh, obviously a game that you've uh, that you had at games and stuff. I do like those blue monster fight club trees. I didn't think I would like them, but they actually look pretty cool. Yeah. This was part of our War Cry League, and uh, so I have these crazy floating islands um, that that you know we we put out there, and then you could there was little magical portals which use these little light up dwarven forge like doorways. And uh, so you could teleport from island to island and uh, and fight between them. And there was a lot of furies and flying critters zipping around, you know, hassling your warband while you're trying to collect a couple artifacts from the tops of the the floating floating pieces of terrain. That's awesome. That's I like cool. your flight stands. Yeah. So these are again another crazy 3D printed thing I found. I had a buddy of mine, uh, Tim Colonna, up in in your neck of the woods, it's Oz. He's up in New Hampshire. Um, he did an awesome job printing these for me. And then you just use a big, you know, 12 inch acrylic rods and one inch thickness kind of thing to, to raise them up. And they just look super cool. Yep. Sick. And those, the bases on them as well are, are really sturdy. So yeah, you'll have to do yeah. a, uh, you'll have to do a, um, uh, what is it? A floating Citadel from Dragonlance. Right. Yeah. It's definitely inspired by that. And then I took similar things and, uh, I have a bunch painted up in my Underdark color scheme to kind of that we'll, you'll see when you see pictures of the Underdark build to represent that weird alien nature of the Underdark and again weird floating rocks and and, and magical things going on. Yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, Jim Slayer saying I enjoy using the setup that Jake has when I actually get the chance to play. I appreciate that. It, it does. It does. It does feel good when someone's like, "Oh, this table all matches." I'm like, "That's what it should look like." Yeah. No, I. I Love this one in particular, Jeff. I think um, a lot of folks have done tried to do uh, like floating island tables over the years, and uh, yeah, this is this is definitely very cool. I want to run this a little more spread out on a bigger board with a lot of like teddy bear padding clouds and stuff around it, okay. and uh, with float with floating ships. Like uh, they make a Eberron sky ship from Whiz Kids, or like a flying ship, and I want to you know have some flight flying ships and stuff. And uh, maybe some Zinch stuff going on, screamers, and you, you gotta know. you gotta mix in all the uh, Caradon Overlords boats. Yeah, exactly. Where the Overlord boats and different things would be really cool as well. You know, was, I remember when the this makes me think of that. There was a when the Caradon Overlords first came out. All it says is that they're on X size base. It doesn't say anything about how high they are. So this guy that we know got these really because he was like, I hate flight stands. So he bought a bunch of plexi rods like this, and he mounted all of his boats. And he wanted to look like they're flying, so they're all like twelve inches up. <laughs> so he put them all on the table, and we, we were playing. And Adam, Adam Pratt, who you guys all know, was playing him with his orcs, and he was like, "I can't, I can't reach the boats." 
And we're like, what do you mean? He's like, well, my guys are armed with spears, which means they have like X inches of like range. <laughs> one, one certain base contact. And I was like, right. He's like, so technically speaking, I can't reach the boats. And I was like, that's messed up. I think you're just supposed to go by the base. He's like, that's what we did. He's like, but it, looking at the rules, technically you could model to advantage and no one could attack your boats because yeah, they're range. out of range. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, that's so messed up. But... <laughs> So all these orcs with spears trying to like kill your boats that are way up in the air. You need, need a whole bunch of uh, Sean's luminous um, ballistas, the <laughs> star yeah, shard ballistas. ballistas. That's, that's what you need. Yep, that would be great. But the gore, the gore grunters and the brutes, like there's, they have no range. There's no archers in that army. So, yeah, yeah. no, ridiculous, ridiculous. Uh, I'm sure they, they clarified that now, right? It's just oh, they definitely have. It's just but the base the time, of the model now, or. But at the time they didn't. It was you moved the model in, and then they had to be within range of. They have to be able to touch the model they're attacking. Right. And it was like, well, technically speaking, the boats are out of range, so you can't touch them. <laughs> silly, <laughs> silly. Uh, excellent. So the next one is, um, I think this is a build that you did uh, back when we first launched the um, tremendous tome of decorating dungeons. Kickstarter. Right. February last year, um, so the the dwarven uh, dwarven hall lava field. That's, that's great. Yeah, kind of obviously inspired by Khazad Doom, the grand staircase kind of coming down out of the mountain. Uh, there's a doorway in that mountain piece, and then it comes down, you know, and then across a bridge to this other side. You got the dwarf statues there, and uh, you know, it was just a just something I wanted to build. I, I'd seen someone online on Instagram build like a big staircase out of the, some of the Dwarven Forge pieces, and it inspired me to put my own spin on it and, and make this, you know, crazy thing over stairs and bridge over lava into a, a Dwarven hold. Yep. So that was that was lots of fun. What's the uh, what is the the piece at the back? The back like the backdrop there. So the years ago, I found two of those pieces at a local train shop. And it was an old, like, Woodland Scenics, like, biscuit foam kind of cast okay. thing for, like, to probably to do train, you know, uh, like, canyon walls or something. Okay. And at the time, the guy just had them sitting there. They were, like, like an inch of dust on them. And I was like, hey. And he was like, ah, 50 bucks. I was like, deal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, grab both of them. One I just did in, in standard kind of stone color. The second one I actually mounted. I cut a part out of it and put and built an actual dwarven doorway entrance so it's the outside of the mountain kind of like the Eridor, er Erebor entrance kind of thing in into the side of the mountain and those dwarven statues can go in front of it and and different things and i magnetized a bunch of like old fantasy dwarf icons to go over it in gold and different things so yeah i made the outside of the dwarven dwarven kingdom that's awesome awesome yep uh yeah uh james lacure Lacour? Yep, James Lacour. Uh The Oryx Power of Belief. There you go. Yeah, he's a, he's another XGW guy. James worked for me when I when I was at the Natick Shop. Excellent. Uh, but yeah, it, there you go. Something we hadn't thought of. Yeah, of course the Orcs can hit those those boats. Yeah. Regardless of how well oh, they yeah. are. I believe I can hit the boat. Unless what? Unless it's painted purple. If it's painted purple, you can't see it. Can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> then you wouldn't try. Wouldn't try to hit it. But that's uh, uh, really cool. I love that um, that setup. Uh, yeah, that's super cool. The, Jeff, is it is it is the staircase all like modular? Yes, it's all modular okay. dwarven forge pieces. So they kind of go in a spiral up either side, and in, in their build, you can just rotate it back and forth, to kind of to nice. be the winding stair down. That's awesome. This looks like a Mordheim table. Sorry, <laughs> we're jumping around too much. Oh. I, I, zip, I zip back to the uh, the dwarf one so that we can see that, but. Uh, Yes. Uh, so yeah, the the, uh, the town table, the town square, and the uh, the lanterns. At night, and... it, it is actually my my take on on Waterdeep. We were playing Forgotten Realms D and D, and that's part of one section of Waterdeep that I I built up with. Uh, I have a ton of the foreground fantasy buildings, and those are the Dwarven Forge city streets and. Uh, you know, and their little great light posts and things. So yeah, that's that's, dude, that's, that's so awesome. Water deep at night, and, uh, I, and take, they were I take thirty slingers. I take thirty grot slingers. 
But it does look but yeah, cool. Yeah, so there was they were investigating, you know, uh, a disappearance of a shopkeep, and you know they could explore all around the town and and go into the sewers and different things. So, yeah, I had a lot of fun, and the, it just the pictures came out really well when I turned the lights out and had all the the street lights on, the little little lanterns and things. Awesome. Hey, uh, speaking of which, foreground doesn't exist anymore, do they? Correct. They yeah. are basically have, have gone. I have one giant box of unbuilt terrain uh, houses left. I think, to, I think we to still have my city. I think we still have three or four foreground buildings flat packed on the shelf. Yeah, but I think that's yeah, I think their, that's their fantasy left. line, their Mordentburg or whatever they called it, was super super great. And uh, I have everything from their giant inn to the blacksmith shop and all their different buildings and stuff. And uh, I love them. They they just look really really good. Yeah. I think the thing I like most about their stuff is is how easy it is. To be, like, there was that whole craze of every, everybody and their mom making like three D print, three D, like laser cut MDF terrain, and there's just so much of it. And foreground being like, oh yeah, it's all painted. Yeah. Like I was like, Absolutely. that's a, that's a game changer. It's like it doesn't cost anything anymore. It's to basically get it fully painted. Like their stuff is their stuff is great. Yeah, or was yeah, it was it was it was a a, a great great line for sure. Yeah. Definitely cool. I think there's um one of the things about this image just it for some reason just reminds me of a um a video game. Sure. Oh, yeah. It's the, the the something about the lighting, something about the arrangement there. It's almost like um that I'm about to sort of zoom down, like camera zoom down to or move down to um like that street on the right and then start walking forward. Yeah, this could be like, this could be like yeah, this Assassin's Creed or camera and just sort of shift as you go and see yeah. and they walk into that uh, thing and then you hear somebody belch and uh, then somebody a lady of the night would invite you into her room but, who's uh, like Baldur's Gate is that what we're doing I'm not sure yes is, is it what it is okay I don't play video games so I'm just imagining this is what they're like <laughs> double click on mints go for the eyes boo the eyes yeah awesome uh, and then the the final one, uh, I think the final one I've got here, Jeff, is uh, one, the sewer shot. So with the green, uh, the green. Yeah, glow. this was more of a like it was part of the them adventuring down into the sewers after they left the town. But this was again one of those just stage shots of like throwing some some light pucks down and covering it over and just make a really cool picture of some guys about to embark into something they really probably don't want to mess with somewhere down in the sewers and the, and the strange green lights emanating yep that's rad yeah light effects make such a cool difference on like cool tabletop setups yep and you know most people think with lights you have to get into uh, wiring and, and lots of leds but you can do a lot with these crazy cheap cheap little light pucks that you can get on amazon that have all the different color settings and, uh, you know, it's all about where you tuck them away and hide them. And then there's no wiring or anything else involved. And they have like a little remote and you just turn them on as you need them. And I use them to light buildings and tunnels and, you know, hide them behind different things. And it, it all comes out really well. Yep. In the, um, uh, the photo shoot that we did on Sunday for the, uh, for Jeff's underdark build, um, he put out a whole. There was a whole bunch of the the pucks out there in different places, all hidden with the emanating different light, and usually purple or green. And uh, and I was like, oh, for this shot here, I think we just need a couple more purple ones up here, maybe three or four purple ones. Um, Do you have any more, Jeff? And he goes, yeah. And I turned around and looked, and there was like another thirty ready to go. <laughs> it was very impressive. I don't think he had all I, the. I, I, I don't have a problem. I, I don't know what you're <laughs> Not talking a problem about. At all. <laughs> Jeff, can stop, Jeff can stop anytime he wants to. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. He just doesn't choose to stop. That's it. That's it's not it. a problem. Yeah. yeah, for sure. The number of strange things I've bought because I like this will look really cool once and then. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I think. I think the, the, uh, the funniest D thing I've ever seen used is the other day my buddy was running a game, and they're playing up north, and they sent me a picture of it, and it's like. It's like a top-down shot onto the gaming table. So it's like, you know, I see like the five party member miniatures, and then they've got some trees, and they had like a battle mat out, and like a ruined castle, and then the new flying Tiamat. 
And I was like, that's super cool. How many times are you really going to use her? Like, <laughs> it's Tiamat. Like, you're not going to run into her routinely. She's not a wandering monster. She's going to murder the whole party and then bail. Um, it, it was kind of why I was shocked that they made the $380 Tiamat and the $400 Tarisk. Like, you're going to use them maybe once in a game ever. <laughs> like, what, wow, I mean, they I, look cool on your shelf, where people are like, "What the hell is that?" You're like, "Oh, that's the Queen of Dragons." Like, don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, I think if you if you have bought that model, it's it's quite okay for you to go through and scratch off like the last entry on every Wandering Monster and replace it with Tiamat. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. She's just like hanging out, wandering around the forest. Okay. Roll a D20. Kind of like the D and D cartoon level. Oh. She just showed up all the time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But she never, all she does is like breathe fire at Venger. Venger throws a couple of fireballs at her. And then, like, they end up getting like into it while the party escapes. Yeah, Venger. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Voiced, voiced by Peter Cullen, who is Optimus Prime. That's his only villain role, is Venger. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, Josh the same thing. Tiamat was all over. She, yeah, the old DD cartoon cartoon was lousy with Tiamat. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Every time I see her, once I started playing and I was in middle school, I remember being like, "How are they all dead?" Like, she just shows up and like she just shows up and get on like she shows up. They're all like, "Oh, that's Tiamat," and then she kills all of them, including Venger. Like, <laughs> yeah. she is a god. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. Why do you, Why do you think they went down that path? Why do you think they chose to do that? I think it was a cool foil because Venger, like Venger, was always like, "I'm about to crush these stupid kids," and then she would show up, and he was like, "Oh, I have to make sure that I don't die, so I have to like keep her busy, and then they escape while that's happening." Right? Because Venger never like defeats Tiamat. Okay. And and it's not like she eats him. He like, like ah, curse you kids, and like flies away. Is usually what happens. Right. The dude with wings who flies away on his flying nightmare steed. Yeah, oh, the best. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying there were some uh, there were some plot holes. <laughs> is what you're saying. His, his, uh, his sidekick Shadow Demon is the best. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. There's another. It's uh, just another show that uh, I don't think ever made it to Australia. Oh, dude! It's so you you can watch it now. It's I'm, I think it's all on. Is it all on Hulu? Yeah. I know, I know it's up somewhere because a friend of mine started watching it. I was, he was like, "It's great." From, from the sounds of it, I, I don't think I should be watching it. Oh, it's it's pretty good. I mean, yeah. in terms of like in terms of enjoyment, it's pretty fun. Okay. Um, Shadow Demon, Shadow Demon is like the source of and solution to all of the problems in that show. Right. Because Vendor's like Vendor's always sitting around like in his throne, like, oh, "How am I gonna how am I gonna kill those kids and take their weapons?" And Shadow Demon's like, "Well, you could always do this thing." And then they try that thing, and then it goes sideways. And Vendor's like, "Ah, oh, what went wrong?" And Shadow Demon's always like, "Ah, if only we had handled it correctly." Like that, that's every episode. <laughs> so, great ideas, not so much on the execution. Yeah. Oh yeah, about. yeah, okay, yeah it's, it's the best. <laughs> and it had that like greatest American hero level of like nobody knows how to use the weapons right, other than like the ranger. So. You know, they, they didn't have the instruction booklet, so Presto could never pull the right thing out of his magic hat and, and all this stuff. And and the Cavalier just had a shield, never a sword. He just yeah, had a that, shield. That always <laughs> okay. cracked me up. The girls, the, if you watch the show, the girls have their shit together. Like, yeah. the, the two girls are almost like, why is the party this dumb? Because yeah. it's like one girl, one girl is the rogue. So she has the, or she's thief. So she has the, this like cloak of invisibility. And it's like, I'm wearing a cloak. As soon as she puts the hood up, she's invisible. Right, okay. And and every episode, she does not make mistakes. It's like, oh, we need to do this. And it's like, well, how are we going to break in? And she's like, I'm just going to take care of this. And then she comes back and she's like, hey, guys, it's me. I got the item. And you're like, oh, wow. she's She knows how to do her job. And then, like, the <laughs> acrobat, she has this cool staff that was like a stick that she could, like, take out and it would extend. And she would, like, flip over stuff and use it to pole vault and, like, whack people. It was a quarter seven. And I was like, oh, she seems to have her shit together. And then, like... But yeah, to Jeff's point, like the Presto the Wizard, his idea is he has a magic hat and he like pulls items out of it. It's always like, oh, we're fighting this giant, you know, monster made out of hay. If only I could figure out something to do. And everybody at home was like, light him on fire, light him on fire, or, like throw water at him. And he's like, uh, it's a white rabbit. Like he's useless. He right. is the worst. <laughs> I believe at one point in time, he pulls an aircraft carrier out of the hat. Really? <laughs> Oh, Jesus. I think there's an episode where he like somehow pulls this giant and like he just shoots this giant aircraft carrier out and you're like, what what just happened there? Like I, I don't know what just happened there. 
He was crazy. Bob, Bobby, Bobby, like the Bobby, the Bobby's the little kid. And he's the barbarian. He has this club that's like super strong. So like anything he hits, it like gets smashed. It's and, like Bam Bam. He's like Bam Bam. Yeah, but he was actually like probably the most competent fighter in the group. Yep. Nice. But you no, know, as a, as a kid, I always wanted Ranger's bow. Ranger's bow was the best. It's the coolest magic item ever. You're shooting like energy arrows that, yeah, without a bowstring. Like, why wouldn't you love that? Yep. That, that he was great. great. Nice. Cool. I always imagined John Cusack as the uh, as the Cavalier. Nice. I can see that. But uh, cool. So we've had a look at a whole bunch of uh, t table shots that uh, Jeff sent through. I'm just going to quickly say uh, Jeff is also on Instagram uh, RPG Terrain Builds. Uh, I have linked to Jeff's Instagram in the notes below. So you can go and uh, check that out. Uh, give that a follow. Uh, and do you, do you want to give him your OnlyFans, Jeff, or say that? Uh, you know, you, the, it's in the link tree on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so go to his Instagram, go to the bio, follow the link tree. There you go. It'll be, you yeah. you got to want it. <laughs> you gotta, what's that? You got to want it? Yeah. You gotta want it. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than more than two clicks, so uh get it going. But uh sorry, uh Chris has joined us. Uh, well Sean says uh Avenger wanted the magic items to defeat T Mat. A hundred percent. Yep. So uh Chris saying good evening, uh just getting home from work. Chris, you missed the first hour. Um that's cool. You can go back later and check it all out. Uh you'll get to hear the tale of of how much uh Jake has not painted for his army. Uh Jeff, almost Chris, done. Almost done building. Chris is the uh, Chris is Jake's opponent at. Yeah. Uh, I'm probably gonna play Brian too. Brian will be there, I believe. So um, we're gonna get a couple games. And Brian, uh, Chris is doing a list that is similar to mine. He's doing a uh, an Imperial Fists tank list, but he also has like some infantry. Um, but I believe we're both doing. Uh, I believe we're we're both doing variants of the Armored Spearhead. Okay. But the only way you can have infantry in a spearhead is that they they if they don't start the if they don't start the game in a vehicle they are immediately removed as casualties. So I think he's doing like a tactical squad. I think he has a twenty man tactical squad and a Spartan. And I think he has a command squad and a Rhino. Um, but so they'll they'll start in vehicles. Right. Yep. Excellent. He says, uh, "Sorry, <laughs> my stupid job changed my schedule." Boo! Boo to stupid That's jobs. Right. No need to apologize to us though. All good. Uh, Jeff Smith has joined us. Hi, Jeff. Uh, hey, Jeff. Sean oh, says, yeah. in the uh, 3.5 adventure, the bow was casting magic missiles. No, the bow was way better than that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, yeah. Excellent. Hey, got, Chris has two tactical squads in Rome, and a despoiler squad in another. Imagery. Do we? Did anybody else just get that? Got a little, a little lot of stutter. Like, hey, hey, hey. Little dis oh, is my is, is my mic cutting out? No, a little dis yeah. Discord lag, I think. Maybe. Yeah, I think it was lag more than anything. Yep. Two tactical tactical squads in rhinos. One breach a squad in a land raider, uh, and one despoiler squad in a land raider. So. Yeah. Okay. Should be fun to watch. Should be fun to watch. Uh, but no, definitely cool. Um. One of the things I was going to uh jump to talking about is um so with jeff being uh super passionate about all the doing all these table builds for uh wargaming and for role playing um when we started working on uh oh last year as well we launched the uh the kickstarter for the tremendous tome of decorating dungeons uh back in december where it was my idea we we're gonna do um Kind of like a, a how-to sort of terrain book, but focused on dungeons, both creating some um, some of your own stuff, but also taking existing products like the Warlock Tiles from WizKids or Dwarven Forge or Monster Fight Club stuff and repainting it into the setting of your choice. Um, uh, but through um, some feedback during that campaign, we got... Uh, we came up with some other ideas. We sort of realized that it would be cool if we did a um, did the Epic Dungeons book. Uh, so we came back to Kickstarter in October 
and uh, funded that. So the Tremendous Tome of Epic Dungeons, where we're actually featuring, I think it's almost 20 different builders. From yeah, definitely. I mean, we had some of the best builders out there, people that have, have quite an awesome following online, Instagram, you know, people who have built stuff for people like Joe Manganiello and, you know, WizKids and, and people who do setups for, you know, some of the Watsy things, um, you know, it, it just people that are just passionate as well. And as well as people like the Horchar and stuff who are just building crazy cool things out of foam. And, and so we're able to show off the feedback was most people wanted a more coffee table book of like super inspiring things. And, and we were very excited to be able to bring that to life with uh, working with all these, these great builders. Yep. So uh, I, I'm super, super happy with the progress. And I think the book's going to be just, just blow people away when they get to see it all and in, in laid out. So very excited for it. That's awesome, man. Yep. No, it's definitely, uh, definitely going to be very cool. I'm, I'm super excited. We've got, uh, we, over the last, few weeks we've got in stuff from uh, a couple of our friends in canada who have uh, youtube channels so we've got uh, some photos of um neil at real terrain hobbies uh he's been building a castle like a uh, massive um castle based on a based on a video game i think i think it's talmberg castle is the name of it um and uh yeah just this awesome massive castle up on a, a huge rock outcrop um so we've got photos from that. So his YouTube channel is Real Terrain Hobbies. You can go there and check out the castle. Uh, we've got um, a table build for uh, Idols of Torment um, from um, Jeremy at Black Magic Craft. Um, so Jeremy kickstarted that game October last October November last year, I think. Um, I think I might have launched on Halloween, Halloween night. Uh, but yeah, very cool. Um, very cool game set in a uh, sort of a collapsed heaven and hell purgatory kind of thing. Everything's yeah, sort of being mashed together. Demon war bands and and the final forces of good and evil. Yeah, kind of battling it out. Just very very cool and a lot of really strange terrain. You know, obviously in a, a metaphysical purgatory type setting, which is really cool. Yeah. And I was um, really excited to um, hear about the the way. So all the terrain pieces on this table are on round bases, uh, because something that can happen during the game is different forces uh, can cause those uh, terrain pieces to turn. So pivot on on the spot. So uh, one of the pieces he has on there is a bridge, which has got three three different round bases so if you're on there and that one in the middle turns all of a sudden you're stuck up there you can't get off you can't complete your objective to to do whatever you need to do unless you're willing to fall to the ground um they i feel like i feel like they've done the community at large and like the industry in general has done so much to like move the idea of rpgs and immersive play forward um, like I, I had a guy come to my store the other day who's, I mean, he's, he's, he's similar age to us, right? He's a little, a little bit older than me. Um, a little bit younger than me. Like, That's is that what you're saying? I'm not saying <laughs> I, anything. I hear you. So he, okay. He, he was telling me that he was talking to his wife about something that he saw on, uh, like a podcast or something. Yep. And I, I think it was, oh, you're talking about Joe Manganiello. So in the campaign that Joe was in, there's a whole thing where he cuts off his hand so he can put the hand of Vecna onto his character. Yep. And he was like so excited telling his wife about it that his wife was like, maybe you should just start playing Dungeons and Dragons again. Now he hasn't played since he was in like, he thinks in like high school or college. So it's been like at least 20 or 30 years since he played. Yeah. So he came in to buy like a new player's handbook and we were kind of chatting and he's like, yeah, I remember back when I used to play, you know, he's like, you have all these miniatures and like, I remember buying metal Ralph Partha stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm like, I have a ton of Ralph Partha ones. And he was like, you know, we all have like the chess X maps. And I was like, right. And then I showed him like the Loki battle maps and I showed him like how to make, I showed him Mel's like how to make terrain book. And I was like, there's so much stuff to do now. I was like, but it's so much easier and approachable for a new player to be able to do this. Like yeah. to Jeff's point, you buy like the, you know, like the, the, the whiz kids cardstock Icewind Dale buildings that are like some of the easiest terrain you can get. 
and they're relatively inexpensive and like you get the Loki battle mat you pop out the giant battle mat build a couple of like cardstock buildings and it it looks pretty good like yep. you know right out right off the bat like it's like here you go you can run your immersive D D game um I, I just think they've made it so much easier for people to like sort of push the door open and, and check stuff out and get into it and the fact yeah, absolutely. that the, the fact that jeff and all the guys you've talked to are still doing like old school custom scratch built terrain is awesome because yep. it inspires all the people that are making all the stuff for everybody else to try to get into it on their own because like i don't expect some brand new player to go well i'm just going to sit down and custom build a you know a six foot table of underdark terrain it's like i mean that'd be great i don't know if he's going to do that but it's 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 a really it's a really neat way to kind of get more people into our into our hobbying world so yeah and one of the things and um one of the other builders that's kind of i believe it's going to end the book dave is ryan devito's giant crazy thing kind of you know we're ending on a on a level that it kind of has to seem to be believed it's you know like a table that i, I don't even know how to describe it there, sometimes. there are there are maybe two other people in the world who uh approach ha, who have the hobby of creating these dioramas like uh like ryan does yeah. yes i mean it's a 30 foot by 10 foot wide table that just covered with thousands upon thousands oh, yeah I'll just, I'll just put that out in my yard like you know <laughs> but, uh and but something that he does and, and kind of say my my same approach is that none of this stuff is permanent it's not like i'm carving a giant foam thing that's always going to be there like yeah. it's it's using as much modularity as possible and then stuff that can be used in tons of different builds whether that's the dwarven forge or the monster fight club hills and trees and different things so you can try to use them over and over again in lots of different settings um and different arrangements you know even the giant underdark table is still all modular so i can rearrange it to be different parts of the underdark or different things so you know i i love the ability to keep everything constantly being reused and and things yep. you know because i think in back in the day when you were thinking more of like a train modeler you know th there was a set piece that was always the same you know it had a tunnel it had this it, you know and it wasn't able to be torn torn down and, and turned into something else you know for the next week yeah and uh something i i really enjoy no it's definitely uh definitely cool i think um one of the other people i was going to mention was um rp archive uh so it YouTube channel RP Archive uh, has done a lot of um, videos on crafting the terrain. So the terrain that he creates is out of um, out of foam, XPS foam. Um, he uses a lot of um, magnets as well. Uh, and through the the photos that he sent us, we've got a, a cool narrative of the sort of adventuring party crossing this bridge into a. Um, uh, into a castle and going down into the dungeons and then down even further into um, sort of like a magma hellscape kind of thing uh, with another very cool Khazad Doom um, inspired staircase over lava. Um, and each of those photos or those settings, the same pieces have been used. So it creates like cubes of stone with like the brickwork on them that kind of thing so they can be used to create this bridge or this wall or this dungeon or these this staircase they're all the same mm -hmm. pieces um and he has a YouTube, youtube channel that tells you how to make them um which is all super cool so yeah really excited yeah. about where we're at we can do a lot of stuff now with the way you just magnetize things and whether that's a building that has a, a hidden like metal plate on it that you could then attach like you know a decorative bit or, or other things some of the star wars buildings i haven't finished yet but i, I have a whole non-desert scheme more of a coruscant underworldy kind of set of buildings and i put magnet pieces on all them so i can have that uh area of of running like wires and cords between the streets so, like right. when you walk when you watch obi-wan or something you all there's always that wires and bric-a-brac hanging above and i want to be able to kind of do that as well and running you know different pieces of of, of, of cable uh, like ropes and, and different yep. things you know and you magnetize that washing lines so yeah exactly like the <laughs> wash line and, and other things flags whatever yep. it may be dangling now so yeah that's cool it's definitely um, a lot of fun, and I think uh, 
it's it has been, it's been awesome for for Jeff and I to to work with these folks and uh, and see all this stuff and just be able to think about other other ideas and other things that we want to do with our terrain in the in the future. It's definitely cool. Um, so quickly, I'm just going to jump into uh, some more stuff that we've got from the uh, the Facebook group. Um, but before that, I will see again. Um, maybe maybe I'll do it here now rather than forgetting at the end of the show. Uh, <laughs> yay! If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to uh, hit like, subscribe, come and join us on our uh, Facebook group. The link for that is down below, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other links. I think I've got five or six links tonight. So um, things are looking good, uh, including the link to the uh, Game Envy uh, Kickstarter. What's going on? At the moment. Uh, and the very first time it's appeared in public is the link to the pre-launch page for the um, the art of volume seven to nine. So if anybody wants oh, to go hey. and click on that, I got that approved today and uh, very excited. That'll be uh, coming in April, but uh, yeah, jump down there, click on that. So you'll be notified when the uh, Kickstarter launches. Um, just to let you know, Dave, we just got a new round of uh, Art of One, Two, and Three back in at the shop too. So we have some individual books as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, and four, five, and six should be available to you in about two weeks' time, two or three weeks' time. Great. So we'll make sure that happens. Um, first up here, coming from the group, uh, we have uh, the shop from Chris Jones uh, out in Vancouver or out in British Columbia. Uh, Chris, uh, wasn't feeling, and Chris has been painting a lot. Well, he always paints a lot of dark angels, uh, but he just wasn't feeling, uh, like painting miniatures. So he dragged out a whole bunch of his, um, MDF terrain and got stuck into it with, uh, his airbrush. Nice. So, Ruined buildings. Everybody loves them. You always got to have them. Yep. You do. And these ones, um, I think would work well you know, across a lot of settings. So 40K or um, other sci-fi settings and like a, a ruined slum for a cyberpunk table. Yeah, this um, would be great. In, in, uh, you could use it in Legion a little bit. You could use it in uh, Crisis Protocol. Yep, MCP for sure. But uh, these are looking good, Chris. Nice work. Uh, and the other table setup that we got uh, was from Darren McGregor. Uh, for Relic Blade. So, um, love this table, love this setup. I think the um, the folks at, I'm pretty sure it's um, Black Sight Studios uh, have been working with uh, Sean Sutter at Relic Blade. Uh, and yeah, that's the official like Relic Blade mask and things that Black Sight put out. Very nice. Yeah. It's got that fantastic um, Sean sort of uh, cartoony kind of style. Uh, mm -hmm. and it works really well with that um just the, the, the terrain again the terrain straight out of the box black site studios uh do pre-painted terrain uh laser cut mdf terrain so uh, nice yep definitely looking uh, relic blade is a fantastic game uh, it, it allows you to do a lot of stuff it's a lot of fun ben, ben has a ben has a bunch of it yeah it was so funny i i went to get stuff from him at some show last year and I was like, oh yeah, I work, uh, I work at Alpha Omega. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah. He's like, uh, he's like, you're a business partner, Ben. He's like, he messages me all the time. Like we talk. I was like, I think it's hilarious that like Ben and him know each other now, no. just because Ben orders so much stuff from him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Sean uh, and the and the Black Sight Studio guys should be at uh, Adepticon in two weeks. So yeah, two uh, weeks. It's gonna be cool to go and uh, hang out with those guys again. But uh, it's yeah. awesome too. Like when you order from Sean, uh, like when I got my Relic Blade book, he always like draws a little sketch in there and signs it. So like you know, really customizes each order, and uh, it's always a fun little thing. Yeah, uh, definitely super sweet. I think we talked uh, talked a bit about Relic Blade and uh, Metal King Studio in uh, our skirmish game episode in yep. uh, season one. So if you're watching yep. this now and haven't checked out that episode, go and check it out now. Uh, well, maybe not now. Once this one's finished. <laughs> 10 15 minutes you know all good uh but yeah very nice uh thanks for popping that in there uh darren uh and then we've got a couple of a uh, bit of a quiet week on the the facebook group this week 
Uh, but I um, just wanted to show a couple of models that we did get in. Uh, first one is from Chris, Chris Gorka. Uh, painted up Catwoman. And I thought this was awesome. Oh, yeah, I saw, his, I saw his Catwoman. He posted Catwoman and Scourge this week, I think. Right, yep. I think, I, I think, yep. I think Scourge might have been just before last week's show. Um, so... I didn't. I basically I scroll back through, and I get when I get to last week's show, it was where I stopped scrolling <laughs> when I'm grabbing stuff for the show. Um, she looks great. Yeah, that looks absolutely awesome. I think uh, great work on the on the volumes, keeping but keeping everything looking black uh, in her outfit, and um, yeah, I love the base too. Just really, uh, really well done. Yeah, the base had some nice contrast on a model that you want to be all black. So right, yeah, yep, gives us something to uh, separate against. Um, I do have a little bit of a soft spot for the Jim Ballant take on Catwoman, where she's like mostly purple. Okay, I'm not familiar. I'm, a, he took over I'm like the, the worst nerd ever, but anyway, keep going. <laughs> Sorry. What do you got next? <laughs> uh, Josh says, uh, quiet week. Must be getting close to some big convention or something. Yeah, I think seriously. You could, I think you could be right. Uh, next up. So this is from uh, Christian Simonson, uh, who has been posting loads of fantastic uh, Oh, dude. Sons His of stuff is insane. Yeah, they are amazing, aren't they? So yeah, like, this week... He... I, I hate... Heretic Space Marines, and they look incredible. You just want to own them all, don't you? I, d I mean, I do. Like I would a hundred percent take that uh, that that Contemptor. That thing looks great. Yep. So you hate Heretic Space Marines, but yet you're doing an Iron Warriors army. Loyalist son, it's the Horus Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What's the name of the um the dude? Uh, so the guy that I the guy that I really like is um Barbarous Dantioch. He's the one that basically is fighting the. The story is that in they're fighting the Hrud, and Pertrabo like dispatches like the twenty seventh like you know whatever, and they like go and they're fighting, and the Hrud use temporal weapons, so a bunch of like they shoot tanks with it, and like thousands of years of age will happen to the tank, so it'll literally rust out and corrode, or like they'll shoot a space ring and they'll age and die. So Barbarous Dantioch, who's the warsmith, gets hit with a bunch of temporal weapons and kills a bunch of them. But he's like an ancient space marine by the time he comes back. And uh, Pertrabo's like, yeah, did you take that? And he's like, yeah. He's like, it, it, it took you too long. And he's like, why didn't we just wait? They were literally like, it's a it's a migration. They were just crossing through the system. If we had just waited, we could have just taken the system. And Pertrabo's like, I don't like that you're arguing with me. So Barbara Santiago's like, okay, whatever. And he takes over a space station. And there's a whole bit in the lore where... Um, he basically downgrades him from like war master to like gas station manager. Right. So he's like running this giant supply station and all these like, you know, heretic warships jump in and they're like, we're going to cut the line. And he's like, uh, no, 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 you need to get back in line. And they're like, the war master said, and he's like, I don't work for the war master. Get back in line. You're breaking the rules. So they like basically attack him. So he like wipes out this small fleet. So they, the rest of them jump and they come back to get him. And him and his men, like, fight their way free. He's in all the books. Like, he's awesome. He wears, like, this silver skull mask that like, is, like, is hiding his old man face. He's the best. The other guy, like, is Kier Valley. He, he, he eventually eye. becomes a dreadnought and is a warsmith in Storm of Iron, though. Like, no, he's no, the, that, that's not Barbarous Antioch. It's another guy, dreadnought named Barbarous, though. That guy's yeah. Barbarous in Storm of Iron. It's another guy named Barbarous, but that the Barbarous Antioch is... Uh, Barbara Stantiog is the guy who allies with uh, Alexis Pollux, and they make the the artificial Astronomicon beacon to help out Gilliman. And Gilliman, like, recognizes his service. And the rumor is that he and his men are what become the successor chapter, the Silver Skulls, who are listed as an Ultramarines chapter, but they're really not. But the, um, yeah, Bar Barbarus is a fairly common name thrown around a lot. Oh, sure. Because like, yeah, yeah. the, right. the Death Guard are from... Barbarous. Well, yeah, sorry, they're, their homework oh, right, is Barbarous. Right. So, um, I'm about halfway through ending the death right now. So I, uh, yeah, quite quite enjoying nice. the ends of the of the the heresy. <laughs> but anyway, um, back to uh, <laughs> back to Christian's models. These ones are that awesome. Is great. He did a he, uh, he posted a squad of uh, Chthonian Reavers, um, which we've got on the right hand side. Well, is that what they called? 
Catalan Reeves. No. Ooh. Uh, maybe? I, th- I think it's I Catalan remember. Reeves. Catalan Reeves, something like that. Uh, but he, yeah, he did just a great job with the, that 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 classic seafoam green Sons of Horse paint job. Oh, like yeah. it, they look phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely spectacular. And his photography yeah, is always great. It always just uh, just sets sets them off really well. But beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Brian Martin said gas station manager of doom. <laughs> oh, one hundred percent. Uh. I was going to say, um, actually, glad that Brian uh, Brian Martin's in the chat. Brian, are you going to Adepticon? Are you playing in the AT, uh, the Adept- Titanicus stuff at Adepticon? I hope you are. I didn't grab any photos of it because I figured we'll show them after Adepticon. Uh, but my friend Ben Hardy is on the um, Adeptus Titanicus team. Uh, and, uh, is sorry, the team that's running the Adeptus Titanicus events. And for the narrative campaign, uh, Ben has created a bunch of tiles, so hexagonal tiles, very much Mighty Empires kind of style. But uh, and when he's gone through, um, oh, fantastic! You'll get to to see see these at the show. Brian is playing in the AT stuff there. Um, they are so imagine those those sort of tiles that either Mighty, Mighty Empires or whatever the, the 40k version of them was, but those um, scaled up and on steroids. Uh, each of the... So across the hex is five inches, these particular tiles that he's created, uh, with all sorts of things. So there are, there are hive cities that stand like five or six inches tall, um, fully detailed. Uh, there are... Um, Mechanicus forges. There, like, there's a, even like a, a volcano, a dormant volcano with a, a little city in the caldera, um, nice. which is super cool. Um, oh, three full days of AT, fantastic. Yep. Um, and he's been designing those, getting them printed up, print doing some printing himself. Apparently, each of the prints take about sort of eight or nine hours. Um, so you can get, imagine the level of detail on these things. Uh, then he's been getting them all painted up, and I think it's just going to be the most amazing thing um, that, that people have seen as far as a, a campaign map goes. Um, it's going to be absolutely spectacular. So we'll make sure we get some uh, photos or some footage or something like that of those at the show, uh, so we can show everybody after Adepticon. Nice. Yeah, uh, super cool. Um, absolutely awesome. But uh, that brings us to the final thing that we need to do this week. Well, almost final thing. Um, All right, we gotta. The next we have, to, we have to pick our build, paint, play winner. Yep. So, uh, Jeff, I think you've seen uh, that we've had um, folks who, uh, well, well, Scott Radom, one of our uh, regular viewers, uh, suggested that we put together a build, paint, play challenge, where the first week you build a model or a unit or something. Next week, you paint it, and then the following week, you play with it uh, so to hit our mantra of build, paint, play. Um, so, did our first one. Uh, week three was two weeks ago. Uh, week four, which is when we should have picked a, a winner, was last week. We gave people a little bit of extra time um, to get their entries in. Uh, and this week, uh, Jake and I took a close look at everything. Uh, Jake came out with a favorite, like one of his favorites. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was like, I, I couldn't choose just cause there were too many, uh, good ones there. So I suggested, well, I overrode really is what I did. I said, no, 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 <laughs> we're going to do it randomly. It so Dave left it all to chance. I, I did. I left it up to chance. Um, and so hate me if you do. If you want to, for um, for the chance, uh, leaving you all up to chance. Uh, but uh, so, I guess we should an- we'll announce the winner, and then you can say who, which one you liked. <laughs> or <laughs> no, go ahead. Do your do your do your winner. Who's the winner? Uh, so uh, the winner will be receiving a um, a uh, basically starter set the for of paints from uh pro, the pro acryl paints from monument hobbies 
um, we're talking with uh, Jason. So once we announce the winner, we'll get that person to contact us uh, and give us their address so we can get that sent out to them. Uh, I'm going to push across here. But basically, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for joining in. I think after Adepticon, maybe a week or two after Adepticon, we'll launch our second Build, Paint, Play challenge. For uh, sure. And we'll probably give away something that we pick up at the show, maybe. Yeah, we'll we can see. do that. We'll see. Uh, so get <laughs> get ready for that. Get ready for Build, Paint, Play 2! Uh, I've rambled enough. Transitioning the slide over now. And the winner, winner, chicken dinner, or paint set, goes to uh, Sean Gleason with his uh, Star Shard Ballista, who's Lumineth Realm Lords. So, congratulations, Sean. Yay! Congrats, Sean. Yay! Good stuff. <laughs> uh, so, definitely uh, super cool. Um, thank you very much for participating in that. Um, but, yes. Oh, Sean was in the chat. I wonder if he had to leave. Hopefully, he's still here. But uh, we, can, we can message him on Facebook. Yeah, it'll be fine. Uh, but no, congrats. No, it was, it was fun. Like I, I think, I think making it random was was probably for the best because there were so many. There's so we had so many entrants and like some of them were absolutely great. Um, if we're talking about just like the coolest thing I that I thought was painted, yep. um, my the my choice was I I couldn't decide between Jeff Smith just because the amount of stuff he painted. He basically painted like a bunch of the dudes for um Marvel uh, was it Marvel United? Yep. Like I think he did like the Hulk and like the thing and Mystique and Storm. Like they look amazing. Um so I was like I really like that. But then uh Drew, is it Drew Carrington? Drew Carrington, yep. Drew Carrington did this spectacular converted Crimson Fists Stern Guard squad. Yep. And they're all converted primaris Stern Guard. They they look I mean I have a soft spot with the Crimson Fists, but they like they just look great. Like they're a great looking squad. So and then he and then he used them to severely punish some chaos player that he pulped uh, the following week. So I was like, "Yeah, well, they, emperor, well done." They were loaded with uh, with flamers and heavy flamers and combi yeah. flamers oh, and no. so much burning, so yeah. much burning. Kill it with fire. It's the only way yeah. to be sure. Yep, yeah, absolutely. But uh, no, congratulations. Uh, go to Sean. Uh, congratulations to everybody who entered, uh, and we look forward to seeing more stuff in the future. Um, but yep. Yeah, so, uh, Sean, drop us a line, uh, and we will get you sorted out. Uh, I think. What do we want to? What, what do we want to do next week? Next week. Well, we get. We get, we get what? We get two shows, and then and then Adepticon, right? Yep, that's correct. Um, I so think... obviously the week the week after Adepticon, that's easy. We'll do a Adepticon <laughs> Adepticon up. recap for sure. That's easy. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I've I wrote down a list of of guests i think we would like to approach um okay but i was thinking what i'm hoping for is that uh i'd still have to get in touch with him but um hopefully uh adam abramovich from uh the army painter oh, okay we'll nice. be able to get him on so we can uh have a little chat about uh speed paint 2.0 uh and um the uh paint development team i think i think they're called the pdt uh okay but basically where they like so now the army painter has a as a group of um content creators uh people who are using their products all the time um to come together and talk about the formulations of the paints what's working for them what's not working for them so they can continue to evolve uh everything and i think speed speed paint 2.0 is the first of the the products for uh from the the pdt yeah i know that there was early videos from like Dana Howell and other people that have tried out some of that stuff well before you know it was officially announced and, and they talked about you know helping develop the the 90 new colors or whatever that will be in 2.0 yep I'm, I'm very intrigued by the speed paint metallics and, and yeah trying those out when they come out I think that'll be uh, pretty crazy so hopefully hopefully we can get him for the show just before Adepticon um, okay so uh I have to talk to him because I think he'll be at the at Adepticon as well. So either he might have traveled there or he might be wanting to spend time with his family just before he goes away. <laughs> we'll find out. Um, 
uh, and then maybe two weeks after that, possibly talking with um, getting Alex and Brian on to talk a little bit about. Oh Warzone. yeah, we do a little Resonova. That'd be cool. Yep. So that could be uh, could be sweet. Oh. Uh, sorry, just looking at the chat. Uh, Josh says Drew played against another Twitch streamer for that. Holy fire, man! Is uh, is the handle okay? Right. Sweet. Uh, oh, Dave says howdy, neighbors. Hi, Dave. Uh, hopefully you're settling into uh, your new digs. Um, things are going well there. Uh, you've caught us at the end of the show. We're just about to say goodbye. Yeah, <laughs> you'll be able to go back and uh, look at. It'll be on. on... Uh, he technically, technically he made it. Technically he's here. He yep. he made it. He made it. Yes. Um, cool. <laughs> so uh, next up, then the last thing we need to do is uh, say goodbye to Jeff. Thanks. I really appreciate you guys having me on. It was fun to, to show off some of my stuff and chat and talk about uh, crazy tables and builds and all that fun stuff. Yep. I, I remember the, I think the first time I met Jeff, I came down for, I want to say it was games day, like 2003 or 2004. And you were running the big like mega battle event. And I ended up getting shunted off to, I worked with Vince Rossmann at the black library, like yep. counter, like the whole time, which was great. Like, I was really happy because apparently I did so well that Vince asked if he could have me the next year, which I was like, oh, cool. Um, but like that was the first time I met you, and and just watching watching you work and watching you organize that, like just having like a million little kids being like, I have this guardsman, I have this Tyranid, where do I go? Like, <laughs> it was it was pretty neat to watch that and uh, getting to see uh, like a whole. It was I think it was the first time I really went to like an actual like tabletop event that was dedicated to like what we do and you know, seeing some of the work that, like, uh, I think I think at the time it was like Chad Mirzwa and Jason Buyaki, like, and all the stuff that they did, and just yeah. it, it was it was bewildering. And knowing that every store kind of chipped in a little bit, but just seeing all those tables like in person was was fantastic. So, yeah, it was it was fun to run all those events and and coordinate all those tables and shipping and and things. And uh, <laughs> but I, I I I'm glad that I don't have to travel nearly as much and and ship containers across the country and, and do all that stuff on a on a regular basis now <laughs> nice no i can i can i can understand that but yeah for sure oh, man. that's good definitely cool uh oh dave humble says he's two steps away from a house uh keith, oh, congrats. keith says uh remember when they got the villain i'm not sure i don't know maybe that means like I, I, I don't I don't know. Know. we'll come back to that keith We'll put a pin in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. No, thanks very much for uh, joining us, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Thank very you much again for, for everybody uh, in the chat joining us, uh, and everybody who watches this afterwards. I'm going to follow up as well by saying, don't forget to uh, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, uh, and uh, leave a comment for us. Not just in the chat, but once the video is live. Um, Josh is great for going in there and doing the uh, the hardcore uh, infomercial sell um for right. us thanks very much for that josh uh but and if, and, if, and if anybody's around if anybody's around and wants to see uh dave or i will both be at adapticon so yep you guys can uh you guys can pop by and see us i'll be most of my days i'll be at the warzone booth right uh but we'll be we'll be around like you can message us on facebook or on the discord and you know we'll make a point to like try to meet up with people so yep uh and i will i think i've got three shifts that i'm working in the uh the hobby area so i'll be helping with uh coordinating the the hobby seminars and um keep keeping uh fort wapple stocked um nice. that kind of thing so come and say hi to me there uh i think uh chris surrey uh who wrote volume four of the art of is doing a book signing uh at the michigan toy soldier booth uh over near registration uh on saturday at 2 p.m um so swing by there and say hi get your book signed uh Yes. Great. <laughs> I won't be at Adepticon, but I'll I'm I'm running at a local convention next weekend up in Pittsburgh again, going back to see some friends and uh I'm taking the giant underdark table with me to uh to run it in person and run a, a ten hour game in, in the worlds of, of the darkness. So excellent. It, it'll be fun. Um, You're a madman. Once you take some photos of that in progress and uh, you post those in the um the yes, play definitely. Facebook group. That'd be great. Yeah, it'd be cool to see thank well everybody thank you guys for for joining us and uh we'll see you guys next week and yep. and as always don't forget to build, build paint play paint.
<laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Bye. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't get anything ready. I'll have to get it sorted now. Hang on a second. <laughs> Shut, Shut up, up and sit down. down. Sit down. Sit down.